Hi everyone, Aisha here. So today we are going to be talking about the topic, do you think that the Lord has forgotten about you? And so I'm going to be teaching today from Isaiah 44 verses 21 and 22. And this is good, you guys, okay? And so I'm just going to read it right now. Remember these things, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you, you are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your, and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And so as I was studying this, I was just like, this is super powerful because number one, the Lord through the prophet Isaiah says to the people of Israel, you for you are my servant. He says that twice. And so he says, and if you in Israel, for you are my servant, I formed you, you are my servant. And so you see the very personal nature of this, where God is saying, you are my servant and I formed you. And when we look at how he treats forming um, in other parts of scripture, you see it's very intimate. It's more like, you know, he references it to as a potter making a piece of, you know, of pottery right so taking clay and molding it into something that's going to be beautiful that's going to be something that's useful and so we see this intimate nature of God's forming something we see even in um Psalm 139 he says for I formed you in your mother's womb I formed you I fashioned you right we see in Genesis when God uh, gave life to Adam he breathed life into his body and Adam had life he came alive and so we see the very personal and intimate nature of this and God is calling the people of Israel as his servant and because he mentioned it twice I went and looked up what servant meant and one of the things that I learned is it meant a special covenant and light to a nation so these people are called by God not just to be called by God I mean that's the awesome in and of itself but they're called by God to be a light unto the nations to be able to reveal who God is to the people and the people will begin to understand who he is and they will follow him and we see this even before earlier in verse in um, Isaiah 44 verse 5 where he says this one will say I am the Lord's another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand the Lord's and um, and name himself by the name of Israel. This is talking about the people who are unbelievers who are going to see the mighty works that God is doing in the in the lives of the people of Israel, and they're going to want to become a part of God's family. And so we are seeing now where God is calling them as and reminding them of their special covenant to him and that they are a light of the nations. And this is really important because if we go back to uh, verse 20, just as scripture above, he says, he feeds on ashes, a deluded heart has led him astray and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And this whole passage of scripture before this is talking about the folly of idolatry, the ridiculousness of idolatry, how idolatry is makes no sense because false idols cannot save. And what had happened was is the people ended up in exile because they were trusting in false and the idols. They were trusting in the lowercase God, um, God with the lowercase G of the pagan nations. And they were following these false gods. They were engaging in idol worship. They were worshiping things that were not of God. They were worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And God ended up putting them in exile as punishment for their idolatry and their sin. And in the passage before that, he was reminding them that these these false gods, these false idols know nothing. They are nothing. They're foolish. Those who practice them and those who worship again, worship to them are foolish. They're condemned. And he's calling them out of that place of false idol worship and rebellion and calling him back, calling these people back to him. And as I started to think about this, I'm like, you know what? How would these people feel at this point, right? Because they're in exile. They're looking at the promises of God. They're hearing these promises of the goodness of God, the great mighty works of God from their forefathers, right? They're thinking about how God saved the people of Israel from, um, you know, the Egyptians in the Red Sea when he delivered them out of slavery. He's th They're thinking about the times of judges when 
the people of Israel were delivered out of the hands of their enemies. And they're wondering right now, why are they outside of the promised land? Why are they out of what seems like the family of God? Why are they abandoned? And I started to think about this. And I love it how first God talks about how remember, right? Remember these things. Remember why you're in captivity. But remember who I am, who God is. And remember who you are to me. So he's reminding them of who they are, their identity in him. They're reminding him. He's reminding them of his character, his track record. But he's also reminding them of the sin that got them in that place in the first place. And he's telling them like, good, look, you might be in exile, but you're not forgotten. Look, you might be in exile, but I'm redeeming you. Look, you might be in exile, but I'm here for you and I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I feel like somebody who's listening right now needs to hear that because you might feel like you're in spiritual exile. You might feel like you're away from God, but God is telling you that he has not forgotten about you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And not only that, but whatever sins that you may have committed that got you to that place, he is forgiving you of his sins. He's wiping the record clean and he will remember your sins nor your or your transgressions anymore. He's forgetting about them. And I'm jumping ahead of myself because I just feel like somebody needs to hear this right now. Because in verse 22, he says, I blotted out your transgressions like a cloud. And if you think about it, like if you've ever looked at a cloud, how sometimes you can look at the cloud and it's there one minute, but then it begins to dissipate, right? And so this is what happens to our sins. And then he repeats it again. And your sins like a mist. So he's blotted out, blotted out your transgressions like your like a cloud. And your sins like a mist. And if you think about a mist in the morning, how it kind of like hangs over the ground. But then it begins to dissipate as it begins to warm up. Right. As lukewarm Christians begin to have revival in their hearts and they begin to hotten up and become on fire for God again. That's the things that got them to that place of spiritual exile, of feeling like they're forgotten about God begin to dissipate as they become renewed again in Christ with new relationship in him. That's the beautiful thing about God. And I think that sometimes we get it twisted because we think of God like people. We think of God like man. We think of God about how we treat people. Because I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've been really seeking God for is the ability to forgive people. Because, and I say this in my book, Navigating the Impossible, when I talk about faith. I said, I was one of those people when Jesus said, you forgive people 70 times 7. So I'm like, okay, that equals 490. So let me get my spreadsheet out and I can count all these times that I forgive this person. And then when I get to 491, I can say, God put the fire of God of Elijah on this person. Boom, let it be done. And like, that was how I was. Like, I was not like God, where God keeps short account of our transgressions against him. I wanted to tally up every wrong thing that somebody did in my life. And I would be like, Lord, get them. Get them. God, do you see what they're doing? And so I was not one of those people who easily forgave. I wasn't. And so when I think about God, sometimes even in my own mind, I get it twisted about who God is, his character, his ability to forgive, his ability to choose to forgive because God is holy. He doesn't like forget like he's choosing to forgive. He's choosing to remember any no more because he loves us that much. And so I think sometimes when we get in this place where we feel like we're in spiritual exile, when we feel like God has forgotten us, we think about how we treat other people and how and our lack of forgiveness to other people, that it makes us hard to turn back like the prodigal son did and receive the warm welcome and embrace of God. We're thinking that God is sitting there, you know, wanting to smite us or harm us or hurt us or reject us. And that's not the case. That's a demonic lie. It's a demonic lie, a sign to keep you apart from God. But God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of love. God is a God of hope. But God is also a God of justice, which is why... And when we talk about returning to him, the people of Israel also need to turn from their wicked ways. 
We see that when people turn back to Christ, if you think about it, like if somebody's walking to you and then they turn their back and go a different direction, they turn, they physically have to turn to change directions. And that's the same thing we need to do with our sins. We need to physically turn from our sins, put our back to the sins and turn back from the things that caused this break in the beginning. And walk towards the only one who can save and who can and who can give us hope. And God is waiting, just like the father in the um, prodigal son. Let me see if I can uh, pull up the scripture really quick. I know it is in Luke. And uh, did I write it down? Did I write it down on here? Yes, I did. Luke fifteen. I'm going to turn to Luke 15 really quickly so you can catch this beautiful um, picture of this turning from, right? And turning back to what represents um, God. And so what he said is that this is how the father received the son when the son turned back. He said, when the son came back, the father he arose and came um and he arose and came to his father but while he was still a long way off while the son was still a long way off the father saw him felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him so we see a couple of things the father arose he was sitting down he arose and ran towards his son embraced his son and kissed his son and this is what God does to us when we turn from our sins. And this is what we're seeing, this picture in this passage right here in Isaiah 44, verses 21 through 22. God reminds his people who they are. God reminds his people who he is. And God lets them know that it doesn't matter what you did. You are not forgotten by me. I remember you and I'm choosing to forgive you. I'm choosing to make your sins before my face dissipate. And I ask you to turn to me, for I have redeemed you. And as I began to look at the language, I realized that God blotted out their transgressions and their sins before the people returned to him. Because after he promises that he has blotted out their transgressions and their sins, he then invites them to return to him. He redeemed them before they even turned to him. And I'm reminded of Jesus in uh, Romans where uh, Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. While we were yet sinners, Christ died on our sins for our sins. It's nothing that we could have done. It's nothing that we could have earned. It's nothing that we could have worked for. It was by grace that we are saved. And because of the grace that God has given us, we respond to that grace by turning to him, by turning from our wicked ways, by forsaking the false idols, turning from what is wicked and what is offensive to God. And we turn to him. And I think it's such a beautiful picture of repentance. And one of the other things that I wanted to repentance, but also love of the Lord. And one of the other things that I wanted to mention too, as far as forgiveness, because we have been forgiven so much, God expects us to forgive other people. And this is one thing that really convicted my spirit about forgiving in Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive others for their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. And that was powerful to me because we all need to be forgiven because we all sin against God every single day. But the thing is, one of the things that can be preventing us from walking in the promises that we see of God from God of restoration is our lack of forgiveness to other people. And so as we cry out to God and ask for forgiveness, as we ask God to renew our heart, as we ask God to remove the heart of flesh and replace it with the heart of stone, we need to remember that we need to have that exact same posture towards other people. It sucks. I know it's hard. <laughs> but the thing is, it's what God expects of us because he gave his son to us. He literally sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us so that we can be redeemed to him. And if he sent God, uh, Jesus to die on the cross for us, how much more can we forgive others? Even though it's hard, even though we don't want to. I'm telling you, like that has been a battle of mine. It's been a battle. 
because I don't want to hold. I don't want to forgive. My natural inclination is to hold grudges. I know I'm really nice, but my natural inclination is to hold grudges against people. And I keep long accounts for what people did. I can tell you what somebody did in sixth grade that pissed me off. And I literally, like a couple of years ago, I'm like, Laura, I am super, super, super grown. Can you help me get over this offense that this girl did when I was 12? <laughs> like, hey, Lord, man, you have done so much for me. Help me to learn how to forgive. Like, help me to learn how to forgive that one guy who teased me when I was 12 about my non main brand shoes. Like, Lord, <laughs> help me. Help me. Because I want to be forgiven. Lord, I want to rest in the redemption and restoration that you promise us, right? And so in order to do this, we have to be able to forgive other people. But one of the powerful things is that I want to make sure that I mention um, is that phrase, oh, Israel, you will not be forget forgotten by me. When I read that, I put my own name in here. Oh, Aisha, you will not be forgotten by me. Oh, you know, fill in the blank about what your name is. You have not been forgotten by the Lord. And I think that sometimes when we're waiting on a promise of God to happen, when we might be in a place where things aren't going the way we think that they should, or we might be hurt for whatever reason, I think that it can be easy to think that God has forgotten about us. And I think, I know with me, like when I'm in a place of waiting, I can get very impatient and wonder where God is. And I remember when, when, um, when my twins, uh, the father of my twins walked out, I felt abandoned. I felt forgotten about, I felt forgotten by God because I pictured that when I had kids, it was going to look a certain way and it looked nothing like it did in my dreams or what I had imagined. In fact, it was very opposite, very painful and you know, not very happy, right? I always thought about, you know, the white picket fence, married, you know, um, happy marriage and all of that other stuff because my parents are married. And when motherhood didn't happen the way I expected, I felt forgotten and abandoned by God. When I had a couple of friends of mine who began to tease me and not really tease me, but gossip behind my back, about me being a single mom and thought that it was funny, I felt abandoned by God because these are people who promised to be a part of my support system. And instead of being a part of my support system, they became a part, another, they became another layer of hurt. And I felt forgotten by God. I'm like, man, God, you know, the father of the kids is gone. The people, some of the people who I thought were going to be there to support me are gone. So how, how do I know? that you haven't forgotten about me. How do I know? I began to deal with depression and I really felt isolated and alone. And then because I was dealing with that depression, it was hard for me to work my business. And so my finances started to dry up. And I'm like, Lord, I feel alone. I feel alone. How have you not forgotten about me? When I started to think about the fact that my parents were still married, when I started to look around at some of my friends who are married and who had kids inside of marriage, I wondered if God's promises still rang true for me. And I felt alone. Even though I had people around me, I felt alone. And I felt forgotten by God. And so I can only imagine how the people of Israel felt. At that time to be in exile, physical exile, emotional exile, spiritual exile. And how these words that they have not been forgotten would have rung in their ears. To be able to give them joy, hope, something to be able to hold on to in the midst of their pain, their suffering, and their trials. And I believe God is calling us to hold on to hope. It doesn't matter what things look like. We have to hold on to the hope of the Lord. And one of the things is, is that sometimes when we're losing hope, it can be subtle at first. But then one day you see how far you've gone. You start to be able to see the effects of backsliding. 
you begin to see, and I know uh, if you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking at my notes. Because for me, it was super subtle at first. It became in my heart. Then it became in my mind. Then it became in my actions. And in my motherhood, and this wasn't just in motherhood. This happened multiple times. You know, in motherhood, um, it was, you know, feeling like God had forgotten about me. And next thing you know, it turned into depression. It turned into financial idolatry. It turned into lack of trust in God. It turned it turned into lack of self-confidence. It turned into um, lack of self-esteem. And next thing you know, I felt like I was in this pit, this emotional pit that was very hard to get out of. And then I ended up dealing with depression for three years because... I began to reside in that place of exile and I believe God forgot about me. And the enemy began to plant these seeds in my head that God had forgotten about me. And it was very hard. But even in my early 20s, I had to ask like, Lord, like what is going on? And I remember in my early 20s when it happened, when I turned from God and, I, and I've said this before, like I literally denounced God. I rejected God, I confessed out of my mouth. That I rejected him. And that. Um, and that ended up. Uh, it was bad. <laughs> like right. I turned it from God. I denounced him. And then I embraced the ways of the world. Partying. Making unhealthy lifestyles uh, choices. Very promiscuous. Part, like became a party girl. A club girl. And that's what I was. At that particular point in time. And that's who I saw myself as. That's how I saw my identity as that. And when you're living two different lifestyles. Because that's essentially what I was. I was one person at, in corporate. And I was a totally different person outside the corporate. Because I was very high achieving. And so I would party five days a week. Because at this part, I was in this spiritual exile because I returned my back on God. I party five days a week. And so a lot, if you're partying at five days a week, that overlaps with work, right? And I remember that, you know, I'm sitting here working on billion dollar projects, multiple, multiple, multiple million dollar acquisitions and divestitures and stuff like that. And then I would become walking in practically staggering, trying to find a hidden bathroom so I can just throw up to get the hangover off of me because I was not okay at work. And I remember one day it was particularly bad. One of my coworkers who I was friends with said, I think you need to stay away from people today because I can smell the alcohol seeping through your pores. And that became a wake up moment for me that I could not live in this place of lack of integrity. That something needed to change within my actions, within my beliefs and within my behavior. And this is in my own, this was in my twenties that I needed at some point to be reconciled with who I was. And at that time, you know, I had been so hurt by the church. I had dealt multiple times with church hurt in my twenties, um, you know, as a mom. Um, but this, like I said, is in my twenties, but I had to be able to reconcile at some point who I was. And God, I had to separate myself from the Lord, uh, from the world. And eventually I ended up doing that, coming back to Christ, accepting God's redemption, accepting God's forgiveness and being able to come back to the family of God. Not because God left, because we see in that picture of the prodigal son, the father sitting there like, OK, he had left the farm, right? He was waiting for his son to come back, just like God was waiting for me to come back. When I came to my senses, woke up and was in like this spiritual pigsty of unhealthy relationship, of unhealthy actions, unhealthy ways I was treating my body and allowing other people to treat my body. I woke up in the pigsty and said, Jesus, I can't live here anymore. I have to come back. And when I gave my life to Christ again, God welcomed me with open arms. And I say this to say, sometimes we feel like we've been forgotten by God, but we haven't woken up yet to the pigsty that we're in. And we need to 
We need to have our eyes spiritually open. We need the scales to come off of our eyes because if we're in a place of exile, we have to begin to assess our life to see what is not okay with you. How am I living my life in a way that might not be aligned with you, oh God? And sometimes we might feel like it might be nothing. Sometimes it might be nothing. Sometimes it just might be a Job moment. Job was a righteous man. But life hit him hard. And so some of you, you might not have done anything. But life hits you hard. But that does not mean that God has forgotten about you. He is still on the throne. He is still there. He still loves you. And he's promised to take that pain and turn it into good for his good, for your good and his glory. According to Romans 8, 28, he says all things, not some things, but all things work together for the good of his people. But all things work together for our good, for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Right. So we know that God will work all things together for your good and for his glory. But if you're in a place where you feel like you're in spiritual exile, you're wondering if God forgives you, if it's safe to come back to God, the answer is yes and yes. He forgives you. He loves you. And he's waiting on you to return to you because he has already promised forgiveness through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. So God has not forgotten about you. He loves you. He is there for you. And we just have to believe it in our hearts and to be able to walk in that belief and that promise that he is faithful to those who diligently seek him. And so please let me know how this blessed you. Please let me know how this blessed you. I'm super excited just to be able to see um, how this is just impacting you thus far. I'm loving it. And so definitely make sure you like, you comment, you subscribe, you share this with somebody else. And I want to encourage you um, to grab a copy of the book, Navigating the Impossible, A Survival Guide for Single Moms from Pregnancy Through the First Year of Motherhood. You can grab that book over on Amazon or at NavigatingTheImpossibleBook.com. Head to NavigatingTheImpossibleBook.com if you would like a signed copy um, of the book. Or you can also go on Amazon to pick up the book. And in that, I really dig through forgiveness. I talk about betrayal as a single mom. Um, and some of the things that I've mentioned in this video, I go deeper into and talk through the process and the steps to learn how to walk in that freedom in Christ and in the forgiveness that Christ file, um, promises and how to be able to just grow your faith and equip yourself to walk in um, the power and presence of God. So I definitely encourage you to grab a copy of that book. Grab two so you can share with a friend. And yeah, I will talk to you soon. Have a good one.